we've been, or I've been going through the Book of Romans, um, just in, when I've had opportunities to, to, to preach. And in the Book of Romans, there's, there's two very clear parts to Paul's letter. There's the theological doctrinal part, verses 1 to, or chapters 1 to 11, and then there's a much more practical application from chapters 12 onwards to the end of the letter. And with this transition from theology to practice, it seemed an appropriate chapter to, to look at at the beginning of a new year as we transition from 2022 to 2023. So just as Paul has talked about what we should believe and moves on to talk about what we should do, so at the beginning of a new year, it's helpful to think about what we should do as Christians. Uh, Paul's New Year's resolutions, if you like. Because as Christians, it's important to believe the right things. It's important to believe the right things. But it is also important to do the right things as well. It's, it's about doing. Because when Jesus took on flesh, he didn't just teach. He did. He did. He healed. He fed. He raised the dead. He worked so hard that he often exhausted himself. So exhausted that he was asleep in the middle of an enormous storm. He did. My food, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me. My father is always at his work and I too am working. So Jesus taught, but he also did. And so what we do, how we live, how we live our lives, is crucially important. And so Paul turns from theology to practice in this letter. He's immensely practical in these chapters. He says at the beginning of chapter 12, in view of what God has done, live like this. Chapter, one, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, chapters 1 to 11, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Chapters 12 through to the end of, letter, uh, end of the letter. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And this morning, at the beginning of a new year, this is what we're going to be looking at. How we live, what we do. In the light of what Christ has done, how do we live? And we're going to see that what we do is the clearest expression of our worship of God. It is true worship. This is your true and proper worship. It can be translated your spiritual worship. This is how you respond spiritually. It can be translated, this is your reasonable worship. In other words, your logical response to what God has done. It all means the same. This is how we respond to the mercies of God. We live as living sacrifices, and it is worship. And we're going to be looking at it this morning under three headings. Firstly, our relationship with God, as in the first two verses. Secondly, in terms of our work in the church, how we serve, that's verses 3 to 8. And then thirdly, in how we love one another, how we worship God in the way we love and interact in our relationships with one another. That's verses 9 through to 21. So first of all, let's look at true worship as we relate to God. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, 
and perfect will. It's important to recognize that we only have a relationship with God because of God. We only know God because of God. In view of God's mercy, God has reached out to us. We have nothing without him. We are nothing without him. God has shown us mercy. The previous 11 chapters were all about that. And now Paul urges us, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to respond in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So we relate to God with our bodies first. We relate to God with our bodies. We serve God with our bodies, with our physical frames. We can't get much more practical than this, can we really? Because Paul is talking about everyday life. He's talking about ordinary life. He's talking about sleeping and eating at work, at home, in our leisure time. Serve God with your bodies. And if the Romans and if we truly understand what God has done for us in Jesus, in view of his mercy, we will respond and we will respond in practical obedience every day in every way. We offer our bodies as living sacrifices. And this is why Paul describes our relationship with God as one of living sacrifice. We are living sacrifices. Sacrifices in our mind's eye are normally dead, aren't they? We think about the Old Testament, all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, all the animals died on the altar. Or when we think of sacrifice, we think of giving something up, perhaps in order to gain something else, but to sacrifice something means to give it up. Our money, our time. In chess, we might sacrifice a piece in order to execute a wider, better strategy. So sacrifices are all about giving up, giving up, handing over, ultimately dying. Sacrifices are dead. But here Paul talks about living sacrifices, sacrifices that are ongoing, sacrifices that continue. And what he's saying is that we should respond to God's ongoing mercy towards us by living as ongoing sacrifices for him, by offering our bodies as living or ongoing sacrifices. And he describes this living sacrifice as true and proper worship. And what he means is it's the only reasonable response that there is. It's the only logical rational response because if God has done all of this for us rescuing us from sin through the body of Jesus Christ his only son if God has done all of this in mercy towards us what is the only rational logical reasonable thing to do it is to offer our bodies as living sacrifices it's our true and proper worship so in view of God's mercy, we worship God with our bodies, with our lives. Then in verse two, Paul goes on to talk about our minds, <coughs> our minds. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Paul, <clears throat> Paul and the Bible are very clear about the importance of our minds. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Think about them. Use your mind. 
Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Think about eternal things. Think about the glory that is to come, about heavenly things. Think about them. Use your mind. Previously, in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind is so important. We cannot underestimate the importance of our minds, of how we think. And here, Paul says, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world. Don't be shaped by it. Don't be molded by the world. Because the world lives by completely different standards. Completely different standards. The world lives by what is fashionable, what is current, what is trendy. Perhaps what is shocking, what is cutting edge. The things that push the envelope. That's what the world thinks about. What's new and exciting. Instead, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, new minds, new ways of thinking. The transformation of our minds is our only defense against the spirit of this present age, which will push us and squeeze us and conform us to its pattern. It's only if our minds are renewed that we will know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Otherwise, we will get squashed. And we cannot be passive in this. It requires discipline because our culture will drag us down through the television, through radio, through podcasts, through blogs, through magazines and books. The, the, our culture will squeeze us into its mold. But we are new men and new women, born again, the Spirit of Christ living in us. The Word of God is our guide, the driving force, the controlling power in our lives is completely different. So be transformed, says Paul. Be renewed in your mind, be renewed in your thinking every day. So how do we relate to God? How do we worship him truly? Well, firstly, in view of God's mercy, we present our bodies as living sacrifices. We live for him. Secondly, in view of God's mercy, we have our minds renewed. We have our, we have our minds transformed. We know his will. God has, has, has had mercy upon us. And in view of that mercy, let us live for Christ now. So this year, let us respond to what God has done for us. Let us offer our bodies. Let us offer our minds to him. Because this is our true and proper worship. So first, true worship is seen in our relationship with God. Second, true worship is seen in our work in the church, verses 3 through to verse 8. True worship is seen in our work in the church. Look at verse 3, chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Paul is God's mouthpiece. Paul is saying, God has given me grace. And through that grace that God has given to me, I'm saying to every one of you, you all listening, got your ears up. I'm speaking on behalf of God, says Paul. And he's giving these Roman Christians instructions as to how to live in the church, as a local church. Firstly, as we're going to see now in, in terms of our service, and then in a moment, we'll see in terms of how 
We should love each other in terms of our relationships. But first of all, in our service, Paul instructs them how to live in terms of their service for each other in the church. And what he's saying here is that God has given us gifts for us to serve one another in the local church. He's gifted each one to serve. The words that the word that Paul uses here for gifts uh, is the word charismata, a Greek word meaning a special gift, a gift given by God. So it's a, a gift that God has given to us, each, each as individuals, to serve one another in the local fellowship. And Paul is encouraging us to use those gifts. Now you might think, well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? <clears throat> to take my gift and to use it. But Paul highlights two particular risks, two things to be wary of. And the first is that we think too highly of ourselves, that we think too much of ourselves and we become proud or overconfident or arrogant, perhaps. Verse three, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't be proud. Don't think you are better than you are. And to, to answer that, Paul emphasizes twice that our gifts and our service is all about God. It's all from God. So in verse 3, he talks about serving in accordance with the faith that God has distributed among you. You only serve in, term, in, in accordance with the faith that God has given you. So don't overreach yourself. God has given you something. Don't think yourself proud because of how good you are. Because anything you have is given to you by God. Verse 6, we have different gifts. We have different charismata, spiritual gifts given to us according to the grace given to each one of us. So the gift is a gift in itself. It's given by grace. It's not about us. It's not about we, what we have. There's absolutely no basis for boasting or self-righteousness or, or, or feeling good about ourselves at all. No, the gifts are according to God's grace. So don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. That's the first risk. The second risk is the opposite. We think too little of ourselves. We think, well, God's not gifted me. What do I have to offer? Or we think to ourselves, how can God help me to serve in the local church? But Paul, Paul says, no, think of yourself with Sober judgment, sober judgment, not too much, but certainly not too little either. And in fact, when you think about it, if we are thinking too little of ourselves, if we're looking down on ourselves, actually, we're not really looking down on ourselves at all. We're looking down on God. We're saying God hasn't gifted me. See, God is, hasn't enabled me. It brings God down. He can't help me to be useful in the church. But Paul says, no, no, each of us has a role to play. So don't neglect your gift. Don't neglect it. Like those socks you got at Christmas that find themselves in the back of the drawer, never to be worn. No, don't neglect your gift. The emphasis Paul has here is on using the gifts that God has given to us. So verse 6, Paul says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. Use it. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give. If it is leading, do it. If it is showing mercy, do it. In the translation Ken read, it's let him or let her give, show mercy, lead, teach, whatever, encourage. The emphasis is on doing it, using the gifts. And to make his point, Paul goes back to his familiar picture of the church as a body. 
He, he uses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, describing how the church is like a body and how each part of that body has its own function. And the point he makes is that the, the whole only functions properly when each of those parts is doing the job that it was called to do. In the same way that the parts of the body are useless without the other, without everything else, the hand is useless unless it's, unless it's doing something for the rest of the body. The eye on its own is useless unless it's providing information for the rest of the body to respond to. In the same way, we have our meaning and we only function as part of the body, part of the church. Now, as we get older, parts of our bodies stop working as well as they should. And that becomes difficult, doesn't it? That slows us down. It restricts us. It becomes suboptimal, which is the current phrase in business, suboptimal. And it's the same in the church. The church doesn't function properly unless all the parts of the body are functioning together. We belong to each other. It's a very powerful image, isn't it? We're familiar with Lionel Messi, aren't we? Lionel Messi. Greatest player, possibly, possibly, who ever lived. But Messi couldn't be Messi without Otamendi. You've heard of Nicholas Otamendi? He's the big guy at the back, nose like this, and, you know, if the ball passes him, he'll make sure the opposition player doesn't. Every Messi needs an Otamendi to get the ball and give it to him. We all have a part to play. So how this year might our work in the church be offered as true worship, our spiritual worship, our proper, true and proper worship? How might, might our service become less about us, less about me, I'm so important, or I'm so insignificant? And how might it become more about us, more about him? Well, only if we serve in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, let us serve in the church. If I serve because of what Jesus has done for me, then I will be serving my brothers and sisters in the church as I should. Jesus, who did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus, who made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus, who kneels in humility and washes our feet. In view of his mercy, in view of what he has done for me, let me serve. In view of what Jesus has done for us, in view of God's mercy towards us as a church, let us serve one another. This is our true and proper worship. It's our response to the mercy of God towards us. True worship is seen in our work in the church. Secondly, true worship is seen in our love towards others. Paul's talked about how it's seen in service. Now he talks about how it's seen in our love towards others, verses 9 through to 21. On Christmas Day, Kevin talked to us about uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah and the birth of John the Baptist and how the whole community came together to worship and to be joyful and to celebrate with them. And, and he made the point that it was community that came together community to sh came together to share in their joy. Well, the bonds that we share as brothers and sisters in the church, the bonds that we share are not just the bonds of community. They're the bonds of family. They're the bonds of family. In verses 9 through to 21, Paul describes how we should relate to one another as family. And his theme, once again, 
is one of sacrifice. Not me, but you. You first. In view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done sending his son into the world for us, let us put the other first, just as Jesus put us first. Now, I'm not going to go through every verse from 9 to 21. I'll look at each point in detail because we would be here all day. But just to pick out a few verses to illustrate the sacrificial nature of the love that should exist between us. So first of all, let's start where Paul begins in verse 9 with love. He says, love must be sincere. The word for love that Paul uses here is that word that was effectively made up in the Christian church to describe the undeserved love of God towards us, us, the sacrificial love of God towards us, the word agape or agape, agape, self-sacrificial love, the love that gives itself, the love of the lovely toward the unlovely, the love of the godly towards the ungodly, the love of God towards the sinner, the love that isn't inspired by a natural inclination or a natural attraction, but rather love that is an act of the will from one to the other. And Paul says this is how we love, self-sacrificially, the love of one toward the other. And it must be sincere. He says love must be sincere, real, true, not pretend, not for show, but deep and meaningful. So how might that self-sacrificial love work for us in our church in, in, in Otford? Well, in our church at the moment, there are new people and there are people who've been here for a while. And that might create some tension, some apprehension, perhaps. How do we respond? Increasingly, wonderfully, we have younger people with us now, as well as the older ones like us. How do we respond? How do we respond? What does agape love think? What does agape love think? What does the self-sacrificial love that Christ displayed think? How does that respond? Perhaps it thinks, how can we change to accommodate these new ones. Perhaps it thinks, how can I serve the church in such a way that respects and honours all those who have gone before? But both speak of agape love, don't they? Self-sacrifice. What can I do for the other? Agape love doesn't think, what do I want? What is good for me? But what is best for the other? It is sacrificial, isn't it? What can I do to make the life of my brother or sister better, easier, more helpful? How can I honour my brother or sister? Honour one another above yourselves, he says in verse 12. Put the other first. Paul continues in verse 10. He speaks about being devoted to one another in love. Devotion, that's a strong word, isn't it? A strong word, devotion. It speaks about being a family. And that is what we are. We are members of one family together in the church. We're not strangers at a bus stop. The only thing in common is wondering whether the bus will come at the appointed time. The only thing that unites people at a bus stop is the bus. They have no relationship. Or even at work. The only thing that unites people at work is working for the company. They don't have any relationship outside the company. No, Paul speaks of love and devotion, the love and devotion of family. These are strong words. And if we are family, then we put the other first, don't we? It's self-sacrificial love. Verse 14, verse 14, 
Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It echoes the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? Echoes the words of Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter 5 and verse 43. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. What does Paul say? Bless those who persecute you. He's echoing Jesus, isn't he? Perhaps he speak, perhaps Paul here is speaking more about those relationships with those outside of the church, those who might persecute the church. But the point is the same, isn't it? Our love is to be sacrificial. We bless those who persecute us. And you cannot get much more sacrificial than that, can you? To bless those who are persecuting you. And that's what Jesus did, wasn't it? Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. Verse 17, Paul says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Again, echoes the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? Chapter Matthew 5, verse 38, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other, or other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile with them, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Paul is saying that the way of sacrificial living is to turn the other cheek, to repay no one evil for evil. Love those who do you wrong, says Paul. Love them. Don't retaliate. Do what is right. Repay evil with kindness. Evil is not defeated by evil and retaliation. Evil is defeated with love and with kindness. You overcome evil with good. And you cannot be much more sacrificial than being kind to those who are unkind to you, to those who do you wrong. But isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what Jesus did? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did not repay our evil with evil. No, he died for us. That self-sacrificial love. And third, verse 18. Paul says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone, echoing Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Paul is saying that the way of sacrificial living is to live at peace with everyone. Live in peace. Don't stir up trouble. Don't agitate. Don't criticize. Don't gossip. Live in peace with everyone, as far as it, as it is possible for you, as far as it depends on you. It's actually positive, isn't it? It's not just sit back and hope that the problem goes away. It's as far as it depends on you. Live in peace. And is that not what Jesus did? He is Prince of Peace. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, isn't it? Prince of Peace coming into the world to reconcile sinners to himself through his own sacrificial death on the cross. His sacrificial love for us brings us into peace with God. So this year, let us love as Jesus loved, which is sacrificially in view of God's mercy, let us offer our bodies as living sacrifices. How? In love. In our relationships with 
one another, in sacrificial love for one another, because this is our true and proper worship. This is how we worship God, by loving one another. So, having spent 11 chapters going through great theology, Paul now cuts to the chase and says, okay, this is what you do. This is how you live. In view of all of this, worship God. How? By living for him. Worship God in your lives. Live like this. In view of God's mercy, respond with true worship. True worship in our relationship with God, offering our whole lives, our bodies as living sacrifices, our minds transformed to think after God's will. In view of God's mercy, we should offer true worship in terms of our service in the church, our work in the church, serving sacrificially. So it's not about us, it's about him. And in view of God's mercy, we should respond with true worship in terms of our love for one another, self sacrificial love agape love not me but you first you even for our enemies that's what paul calls us to so in view of god's mercy how should we live in 2023 i urge you brothers and sisters in view of god's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship.